Welcome, everyone. My name is Kostis Maglaras. I'm the Dean of the Business School. I'm just going to take two minutes and uh, basically introduce to you what we're trying to do here. Uh, climate change and our collective response to this phenomenon is going to really transform our economy. It's going to change the energy sector, of course, but transportation, manufacturing, the food system, uh, all aspects of our lives over the next several decades. And we want, we created this speaker series and a lot of other things that we're doing at the school to be able to basically provide incredible information, action-oriented information to the business community. Uh, this is one aspect of what we're doing, uh, the climate change and the new American economy, uh, which is going to be a speaker series that we're going to highlight important developments in that space. Uh, and then there's all sort of slew of other things that we're doing at the school that hopefully will get to engage all of you uh, as part of uh, your interest. But I won't take any more time. Uh, I think it's incredible to be launching this today with our speakers uh, and, our, uh, and I look forward to more of these in the future. So my biggest partner here is Bruce Usher, so he'll sort of kick us off. Um, hold the applause for our guests. <laughs> so uh, I know many of you, but not all. I'm, I'm Bruce Usher. I'm on the faculty here, and um, I head up our uh, climate climate program work. And you don't need me to tell you that you know climate change is one of the greatest challenges of of our generation, your generation in particular. And you also need me to tell you there's a wealth of information out there on climate risk and climate science and climate policy and what we need to do to avoid climate catastrophe. But what's missing is a greater understanding of the impact on the economy and how we're gonna to get to net zero and what that means for business in that transition. Or to put it more succinctly, we spent 300 years building a global economy driven by fossil fuels. We're now gonna spend 30 years decarbonizing that economy. And there's gonna be tremendous repercussions for every country's economy not least the United States. And as the world's largest economy, the challenges and opportunities here will be felt by nearly every business in the country. So when Dean McGlaris and I were, were thinking about this, this new speaker series and planning this, this, this series, we, we thought long and hard, who could kick it off? Who would be the right person to, to introduce this subject? And we concluded that no one has had, or perhaps possibly ever will have, a greater impact on the American economy than Brian Deese. In his role as director of the National Economic Council in the Biden White House, Brian was the principal architect of the Inflation Reduction Act. And this act is not only the largest climate change legislation passed here in the United States, it may be the largest legislation passed anywhere in the world at this point. It also may be the most impactful. Brian's joined this evening by Vijay Vaitiswaran, who's the climate innovation editor at The Economist. And VJ is, in my experience, and I've seen him many times, one of the best writers and interviewers I know in the climate sector. So our plan this evening is Brian's going to open with a keynote, some keynote remarks. And it's going to be followed by a discussion with VJ, And then they're going to open it up to questions from you in the audience. And we'll have some mics uh, so we can take any questions from the audience. This, uh, uh, this part of the event will conclude at 7 PM. And for those who wish to join us, there'll be a reception uh, upstairs on the second floor at, at 7. So please join me in welcoming Brian Deese. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce and Costas, and uh, to the entire uh, Columbia family uh, for having me um, and for sparking this conversation. Um, climate change and the new American economy, um, I like every aspect of that um, because I think that uh, there probably is no more important conversation for us to have than the ways in which climate change will fundamentally alter the face of the new American economy um, and be the opportunity uh, for most private enterprise uh, investment and innovation in our economy going forward as well. So um, what I'm hoping to do tonight is just offer a few thoughts on the front end uh, and then looking forward to getting a conversation with Vijay and the rest of you as well. Um, and what I thought I would use my time here today to do is to do two things. The first is a quick 
mark to market, uh, so to speak, on where we are in the wake of passage of quite significant pieces of legislation affecting uh, the climate to include the Inflation Reduction Act, but also the infrastructure bill passed almost two years ago. And then also, and perhaps more importantly, a look forward on where does climate and clean energy policy now need to go uh, in the post-IRA world. Um, so to start with the mark for market, I'll move very quickly here. Um, the IRA, a lot has been said, in some ways it's a very simple piece of legislation. Um, it provides long-term, in most cases, technology-neutral incentives for private investment uh, with the goal of driving down the cost of clean energy technology and driving up clean energy capacity deployment in the economy. And so while the public incentives make investments more attractive, ultimately, the test of this legislation will be the appetite of private non-governmental actors, both businesses but also rural co-ops, nonprofits, and others, to put their own capital at risk. So, 14 months after the IRA's passage, what do we know about that appetite? Um, in one word, strong. Uh, in the year ending this June, firms and individuals spent $213 billion in clean energy technologies across the economy. Uh, that's according to a new clean investment monitor that we put together uh, and launched last month at MIT. That's up 37% from a year earlier. It's up 165% from five years ago. And now we regularly see the debate in pages of, uh, uh, on, on uh, social media or in pages of our newspapers about whether the IRA will end up being twice as large as we originally projected or three times or four times as large. Um, Regardless, it's safe to say that the IRA has fundamentally changed the game in terms of private investment in clean energy technologies in the US. The IRA has also changed the paradigm for clean energy and climate policy in two other important ways. The first is that the IRA is mainstreaming a policy approach of making clean energy cheap rather than making pollution expensive. And traditionally, economists, economic policy, Thinkers have favored making pollution more expensive. It's an elegant way to externalize the externality of pollution. Uh, but taxing carbon has proved not only politically complicated, but also uh, substantively incomplete. So for example, if you think about the issue of EV charging and encouraging adoption, an incremental investment in EV charging infrastructure is orders of magnitude more impactful in terms of EV adoption than a marginal increase in the gas tax. And so, um, Many people have come around, not everybody, many people. Uh, my friend and uh, former colleague Larry Summers, uh, I think put it succinctly uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, saying as much as requiring carbon pricing is important, I believe even more important is the dissemination of economically competitive renewable energy. The second, the IRA has shifted the dominant economic challenge we face from one of insufficient demand to insufficient supply. For those of us who have worked in this space, this is an abrupt shift. In the last decade, if you worked on any clean energy deployment issue, take the issue of electric buses, as I did, you immediately run into problems. Too fewer buyers, too little confidence from suppliers, no federal resources to, uh, to support production. Today, the challenge is the opposite. Every municipality wants to buy an electric bus. There are abundant federal resources, and our problem is insufficient availability of electric buses. And so the question now is how do we radically scale supply in the market? And that same dynamic presents across uh, technologies. So these changes, the change in private investment, the focus on making technology cheap, and the focus on supply constraints, they reflect dramatic progress. I used to say to my White House team all the time, as we were wading through the implementation of the IRA, these are high class problems uh, compared to the pre uh, IRA world. But they also demand very new policy approaches. Uh, the IRA has rewritten the script and our policy and our political playbook need to change as well. So what does that mean for going forward? Uh, I want to just touch on two areas where I think we're going to really need to evolve and change our policy approaches. I put these out frankly as ideas because I think a lot of what we need um, and that you all can contribute to is to fill in what it means to operate effective policy in this post-IRA world. I have more questions than answers, but I'm going to tee up a couple of things uh, for us to think about here. Number one, 
we need an American building agenda. We need to build clean energy systems and infrastructure at historic speed and scale. And number two, we need the equivalent of a global climate Marshall Plan to make sure that as we drive down the cost of zero carbon technology, we drive up its adoption around the world. So first on building, there's a growing recognition that we have got to build things much faster and fairer in America. Uh, you've probably all seen these eye-popping statistics. One of my favorites is we're going to need to build enough solar in the U.S. over the next 15 years to cover the entire landmass of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts combined. But building for net zero requires more than new stuff, more than new batteries or electric wires. It requires actually building new systems. And that needs to start with us getting to yes more quickly on siting and permitting of projects. There are critical details in this space. Legislative and administrative, the details matter, and we could get into that in conversation. But I wanted to raise that at the core of this building agenda, we also need to build a new coalition to power the building of America's clean energy economy. We're going to need to bring together activists, policy specialists, private sector innovators, and investors around this shared objective of building. And this is going to require dispensing with old and entrenched impulses in our economy and society. The impulse toward localism, which is about protecting local interests at the expense of public goods and the national building effort. And also some of the impulses in the traditional American environmental movement, which for the better part of 50 years was understandably trained at blocking and slowing down pollution-based building for good reasons. But now in this post-IRA world, those instincts need to evolve and quickly. We need to change this idea of saying no and protecting at the local level to a national effort with local roots that says yes, and then yes again, and yes again, to building clean at scale. And we're gonna need to do this in build coalitions in new ways. Uh, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii, who's been a leading thinker on this, is right when he says, there is nothing intrinsically progressive about stopping progress. And I think just as the last generation was called to action by the phrase, think globally and act locally, we and the next generation will need to be inspired by something along the lines of think urgently and build massively. We also are going to need to distribute zero carbon electricity much more effectively and consume it more efficiently. And again, this is a place where the IRA really supports enormous demand. The demand issues on issues like transmission um, are no longer the problem. The problem now is we need to build a supply side response that is up to the task. We need to eliminate the kind of regulatory barriers that keep us from building that zero carbon uh, electricity transmission system and building a transportation electrification system as well. If you start with the premise that an efficient, safe grid to move clean energy across this economy is an economic and national security priority, a lot of the technical reforms become no-brainers. Dismantling the Byzantine interconnection queues that many of you have probably heard about. Giving FERC, the regulator, the authority to designate national transmission corridors to build. Mandating proactive scenario-based analysis and long-term planning processes. Mandating the use of grid-enhancing efficiency technologies. All of this is hard, but we can make enormous progress on this quickly if we designate it as a, the national priority that it is. And finally, we need to inject more competition into America's energy markets so that zero carbon technologies can actually reach the grid and consumers can actually benefit from rapidly dropping prices. And utilities stand behind many of the obstacles to building clean energy today. Their markets are too often uncompetitive. In many cases, utilities use entrenched market power to prevent clean energy technologies from competing on a level playing field. And lack of competition is a major uh, barrier to entry for innovative and cheaper climate solutions. I hear this time and again when I speak to investors in this space. A common refrain I hear is, yes, permitting is a headache. Yes, siting is a challenge. Yes, supply chain issues are an issue. But at the core, we have uncompetitive energy markets because if you can't compete and get paid, for innovation like a virtual power plant or like demand response to reduce the actual amount of electricity you use, then you're not going to invest. 
And that results in less clean energy investment and higher prices. I believe that we have spent insufficient time as a country focusing on what the lack of competition has done to our energy markets. And I think in a post-IR world, world, that needs to change. We may ultimately need federal legislation to drive toward a single comprehensible market that allows consumer competition and choice. But in the meantime, as consumers, we also need to agitate and inject competition into America's utility market. We have seen very interesting strange bedfellow coalitions emerge at trying to address entrenched monopolistic harms in other sectors like tech and agriculture. And I think the same is long overdue in the energy market. So the last thing I want to do before uh, we move to the next con this part of the conversation is talk about the other half of the equation, or in fact, the other 90% and growing part of the equation, which is outside of the United States. And here, we must be just as bold in enacting new policy that accelerates the global deployment of clean energy. I am not uh, a political messaging person. I generally am a policy guy. So I hope that those of you can help me workshop this and we can figure out the right frame to use. But I think that we need an effort on the scale and the vision of a clean energy Marshall Plan for the 21st century. In his, in his special address to Congress in 1947, President Truman explained that, quote, the United States has taken the lead in worldwide efforts to promote industrial reconstruction. For we know that enduring peace must be based upon increased production and an expanding flow of goods and materials among nations for the benefit of all. Today, America is leading with the IRA, with an historic industrial expansion in clean energy that has massive potential to promote global development and prosperity. Our public investments here at home by driving down the cost of technology could lead to potential savings of more than $120 billion worldwide by 2030. The IRA could ultimately bring emissions reductions in the rest of the world that are two to four times larger than in the United States. But while that potential is in reach, it is not self-executing. Speeding the deployment of clean energy to the world and supporting the developing world's ability to become more resilient to climate change's unavoidable impacts requires an effort on the level of President Truman and Secretary Marshall's ambitions 75 years ago. And I think this must mean at least three things. First, we need to harmonize different countries' efforts to make clean energy cheap in a way that achieves maximum deployment, more resilient supply chains, and avoids unproductive trade disputes. We should be welcoming additional public investment that drives deployment of clean energy. Then we should do the hard diplomatic work of building new frameworks to accelerate and improve those impacts across jurisdictions. On this score, while there's been a lot of column inches and ink about the disagreements between the US and Europe, underneath the surface, we're making enormous progress toward this goal. The United States is now pursuing constructive new arrangements not an old school tr uh, trade agreement, but a new arrangements with Europe, Japan, Korea, Canada, plus allied countries through Asia, through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. These arrangements should harmonize subsidies across jurisdictions wherever feasible and ensure full transparency of public investment. Second, we need to bring our international trade and climate frameworks closer together so that trade and tariff regimes encourage rapid decarbonization from emissions intensive foreign producers. Industrial de decarbonization of things like steel and cement and chemicals is a good place to start, and it has growing bipartisan support in the United States. And you can envision a framework that actually aligns tariffs on producers that fall outside of their own climate commitments, while allowing flexibility for different approaches to decarbonization. I believe this month there's an opportunity between the US and Europe on something called the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminum that could give us a real life template. And this is a model that should explicitly support the least developed countries by reinvesting the proceeds of carbon border adjustments and fees into sustainable development projects or providing special access to clean tech, technology, and exports. Third, we need to massively increase the quantity and the quality of finance that deploys low uh, cost clean technology in the developing world. We need to dispense with the traditional bureaucratic constraints that operate in this environment. For those of you who have spent any time in the climate finance world, 
You have probably been to one too many conferences about the potential of climate finance. It's time for us to get down to the actual work of scaling climate finance. Just to start, U.S. development finance capabilities must be scaled and radically today using existing authorities. The Development Finance Corp, the U.S.'s development finance agency, has the capability to do 10 to $20 billion more climate lending today. The World Bank has the capacity to increase its climate support by 50% today with a focus on more efficient guarantees, more ambitious risk insurance, more focus on climate infrastructure. The Green Climate Fund has potential but must be overhauled to meet the actual goals that it was intended to hit. And we're going to need new tools like foreign exchange risk mitigation, advanced purchase commitments, intellectual property transfer agreements to knock down and get at the practical impediments to deploying technology in developing market circumstances. We have an opportunity to do this in practice because the cost of these technologies is falling dramatically. We can go with the grain of the market to, to scale. And while the politics of reforming our international financial architecture are hard, and trust me, the politics of every single thing I just said in the last paragraph, each of them is extremely hard in the individual. In the aggregate, it's much more uh, doable than ultimately the politics of unlocking new, much, new money, which we will ultimately need. So I will end, end with this. This year, in a couple of months, we will have what's called the global stock take under the Paris Agreement. In 2015, the countries of the world came together and they said, we're going to measure our progress against our own climate goals. And then once we measure our progress, we're going to reassess, we're going to take stock, and then we're going to try to set more ambitious goals. Spoil alert, we already know what the stock take will tell us, that we are not on track uh, to keep global average temperatures below 1.5 degrees or anywhere really close within that range. So we need to increase uh, our ambition. But we also this year know that for the first time, we actually have a viable theory of how we could radically drive down the cost of deployable clean energy technologies and then radically scale up those technologies in the developing world. And I would not underestimate how pathbreakingly ambitious and new that that opportunity is. So our task, in my view, is clear. We need a new policy framework and architecture to take advantage of this post-IRA world. And we can do it in this decade uh, if we get to work. So with that, we'll, we'll get to the work of having a conversation. Great. Please. Uh, thank you for those words. I think um, everyone will have a sense of uh, your outlook on, on the world, but they should know already, of course. We have with us a legend, ladies and gentlemen. This is the godfather of American industrial policy in the 21st century. Um, and as such, uh, I want to praise you for having the courage, to, to, as, lion, as this is a lion's den of financial capitalism here in yes. at a business school. Yes. Um, Have you seen any cover of The Economist recently? You'll know how enamored The Economist is. <laughs> exactly. Well, as a European institution, we've lived through the 70s and 80s of industrial policy in Europe. Um, and so we have some questions for you, and you have been gracious enough to, to uh, accept the questions from me, but more importantly, from all of you when I'm done with my questions. Um, can you tell us uh, you, the scale of climate change, which is also something uh, the last 20 years I've written often about on the pages of The Economist uh, as real and needing ambitious response. What is it, do you think, um, that the approach that the Biden administration has taken, which of course you've been one of the key uh, figures involved in, uh, this approach is suited to the task at hand. Because we do know, I think, in, uh, looking across the U.S. and other parts of the developed world, certainly, and you can look at Latin America and other places, approaches to try to be overambitious with industrial policy can lead to some problems. And it's well documented in the literature. We get crony capitalism, misdirection, misallocation, lack of uh, efficiency, and so on. I don't need to tell a business audience this. So uh, what, why does this set of policies uh, rise to the moment, in your view, and how do, how do we avoid the pitfalls? Well, I'd separate into two things, one is scale and the other is not. So first, we need climate policy frameworks that meet the scale of the challenge that we are facing. Uh, and for any of you who are working in the science uh, of climate change and climate risk, I don't need to tell you, but 
Um, things do not look good. Uh, in fact, we are seeing increasingly warning trends in terms of the uh, breakdown of physical systems that is, is already beginning to occur and may well accelerate. So we need a, a degree of policy scale that can get close to or we can build to the magnitude of the challenge. Uh, I think that the combination of pieces of legislation that the United States has passed over the course of the last few years, not only the Inflation Reduction Act, but also the infrastructure bill, to a lesser degree to build and delegate in the Senate, starts to put the United States in a position where we are starting to get to the scale. So when we talk about the scale of the public investment, starting to get toward the scale. Then it comes to design. Um, and I would say a couple of things, and we can get into some of the specific concerns about industrial policy and industrial strategy. The first is that um, industrial policies and industrial strategies are <coughs> new in America. Or in Let's have you switch mics just to make and sure in, everyone. In hears. fact, um, it's been more the, the 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 norm than the exception in the United States to have an explicit industrial strategy. But of course, there are risks. One of the things that I think is the most powerful about the IRA is that if you look, the vast majority of the incentives in the IRA are long-term and technology neutral. If you are a company and you want to operate against those incentives, you now have a long-term long -term certainty to invest against those incentives. The challenges are more acute in areas where you really don't have a market today. So something like hydrogen, mm -hmm. where the policy tools we're putting in place are a little more ambitious. Um, in trying to actually pull forward demand uh, and also stoke uh, supply as well. Um, and there are risks in those contexts as well. Uh, but I think in, at the core, your question is, you know, can we attack this problem through a strategy of policy that is designed to radically reduce the cost of clean energy technologies as opposed to ratchet up the cost of pollution? I don't think we have a choice. Um, I think that, it, particularly in the United States, but also around the world, um, we have seen progress when we focus on strategies uh, that make clean tech cheap very quickly, and that rather than, I think, kind of bemoaning uh, uh, the, uh, the question of can we get back to some sort of globally ideal stylized carbon pricing, we should put our arms around embracing what is good about the scale of this approach and try to optimize around it. So it's a pragmatic answer, right? That every uh, uh, first principles answer would say there's an externality in the marketplace, we should have carbon pricing, ideally some form of global, concerted, coordinated utopia, and unicorns will also arrive. And, and you know, having advocated this for 20 years, I, I've learned that we need to be practical. So I, I'm with you on the pragmatism, but then you did talk about the, tech, the, the specifics of the pragmatism. Um, the uh, triple whammy of legislation, uh, the IRA, but before it, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, as well as the CHIPS Plus Science Act, they're related in many ways and sort of move in the same direction. Um, I think is mostly carrots, not a lot of sticks. And so uh, one could argue, while it achieves your goal of being politically feasible, and around the world we do see sticks are not very popular, carrots are very popular, uh, it can be much less efficient than it should be. Is there a prospect that we, sh we will see some sticks as well? Uh, because if you have nothing but carrots, you also lead to inefficient outcomes. So I, I do want to I do want to start by saying I'm a pragmatist, and I think this this approach reflects pragmatism. But it is not a simple second best alternative to the policy ideal. If you gave me it's the first best, this is the best of all policies. You know, every policy approach reflects the reality that we operate in. But I guess the point the point the point that I would say so is if you gave me free reign. To, 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 to put in place whatever climate policy I could in the United States. There is no way that a economy-wide carbon price, and forget it, would be the right strategy to attack climate change at the speed and the scale that we need. And we know, and we've seen a lot of the economics community come around to the fact that particularly as the deployable cost of clean energy comes down for technologies, carbon pricing alone is not actually the most efficient way uh, to scale. And we also know that, that this is about systems and about humans and how they interact with the world. And so, you know, the question of why people don't, uh, uh, why people don't do energy, cost efficient energy and efficiency improvements in their home is not about the marginal cost uh, of, of, uh, of pollution. It's about the fact that people don't want to spend Sundays cleaning out their, uh, 
uh, uh, cleaning out their attics uh, and, and have somebody mucking around in their attic um, uh, or otherwise. And and to take away their gas stove either. And uh, well, uh, well, uh, the there. I guess that's the point, which is we're operating through trying to change and improve hu uh, a complicated web of human systems. Um, and I think that we need to acknowledge that. Um, that, that this is, it's not just that there is a first best and we have to operate because of political constraints. We need to learn from what we know. Um, so that's, that's, I think, um, that, that, that's, I think, an, you know, an important uh, lesson and that we need to at least incorporate uh, into our uh, thinking going forward. It's a fair point. Uh, prices alone are less important than the ability to respond to prices. I think Amory Lovins, uh, the thinker on energy, has said that many times, and I take that point on board. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, your idea of a new Washington consensus. I think you've talked, used that phraseology. Um, can you tell us what you mean by that? What, what would a consensus include that might be sort of what comes after the IRA? Sure. So, you know, I think that it is important that we, we recognize that the IRA and this, and this burst of policy legislation is happening in the context of a, a much broader shift in economic paradigm, uh, paradigms. And I think it's fair to characterize, over-characterize that the period from the end of the Cold War till recently, pre-COVID, was defined by a kind of consistent march toward market liberalism that was defined in many ways as a kind of um, a force of nature that was moving in one direction because of the, the sort of overriding economics, Trump's uh, Globalization, politics, the cheap China uh, price, et cetera. Uh, and the like. Um, and I think that uh, that approach uh, missed a lot of realities about the ways in which um, globally uh, brittle, just-in-time supply chains embedded in them w w uh, very significant costs that ended up being borne by uh, consumers or communities. Uh, we all lived that in different ways during the, uh, the pandemic crisis. Uh, but also that the, um, the promise that uh, reducing relative trade barriers has some um, macroeconomic benefit and then it has a set of harms, and we'll harvest the macroeconomic benefit, and at some point in the future, we'll get to dealing with the harms. Um, manifest over years and years and years has, you know, d developed a uh, uh, an understandable sense of skepticism um, that this system was actually operating to the benefit of lots of people in lots of places, including all over the United States. So, what does a new consensus look like? First and foremost, a consensus to actually invest in and build. Um, productive capacity in the United States, uh, demonstrating a bipartisan willingness and commitment to do the deferred maintenance, to upgrade our infrastructure, uh, build, rebuild our water systems, deal with communities that have too long been subjected to um, environmental injustices, to do the work of actually building here in the United States, and then demonstrate that we can do that in a way that then actually harmonize and partners with, uh, uh, with like-minded countries around the world. Is that easy? Is that simple? No. Uh, but I think that there is a viable strategy to do that in a way that actually harvests the benefits of investment at home um, and can help to harmonize those around the world. So uh, you won't get any argument from me that the U.S. has underinvested on infrastructure. I mean, lots of cross-country studies across the OECD showed for many years on R&D, on physical, human, intellectual capital, we've been underinvesting. Um, the concern that I have is that um, in reversing course, as we are doing now, that we trigger a uh, a deglobalization move through industrial policy, where we're already beginning to see tit-for-tat actions, that in effect, it ends up being a race to the bottom, that we actually, in the name of creating domestic industries, rather than, for example, protecting those that might have been harmed by uh, globalization's excesses. There was always trade protection uh, built in, but it was never really carried out, right? Numerous administrations never ful fulfilled the promise of trade adjustment. Instead, if we sw the pendulum swings too far, we end up in a world that actually ends up with much higher cost green supply chains. That the pace and ambition with which we need to tackle climate change, which you've laid out very well, which I certainly share that passion, I think many people, judging by the nodding heads, agree, will be slowed down by the protectionism that we're already beginning to see and the gummed up supply chains. And this is actually counterproductive, that we're having multiple motives and mixed motives for industrial policy, of which climate is just one of them, when in fact it should be expedient as the motive. So, I think we need to be. Um, I think we need to be specific rather than general. And the idea that we're sort of seeing either a a wave of protectionism or b a move toward deglobalization. Um, last year, we broke records in terms of two-way trade between China and the United States. Um, China has largely fueled its growth during the COVID period by um, ex increasing export level growth. You're seeing a change in the composition uh, 
more services, less goods. Um, that in many cases is actually reducing um, the embedded risks in some supply chains. And so uh, I don't think that, I think that um, as much as uh, it's, uh, you, you may be trying to flatter me by suggesting that our industrial strategy in the United States is going to prompt an entire wave of deglobalization, I think that's significantly overstating uh, its impact in the global economy. Uh, the industrial strategy in the United States is really designed to do a, a simple set of things, build capacity in the United States, drive down the cost of clean, uh, deployable clean energy technologies, and at the margin increase more resilient supply chains in those particular areas where we have particular economic or national security priorities. I think you can do that squarely without prompting deglobalization. In fact, in anything, if what we're doing is we're seeing a sort of reduction in uh, maybe the second derivative, uh, you know, we, we, we're not seeing globalization ex, uh, expand at as, as, at as rapid a rate. That's number one. And number two, uh, you know, I hear the argument around sort of free, free trade and protectionism. But I would, you know, I, I would really encourage people to look very carefully at what, in fact, the United States is doing. Um, if this is rampant protectionism, then, you know, I would encourage you to sort of wait and see what might happen on the back end of the next election if you want to see what actual protectionism looks like, right? The, 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 the Inflation Reduction Act provides incentives to invest in the United States. And... Uh, we have not changed relative tariff rates. And in fact, again, if you get beyond the political rhetoric, you are, many of our European allies and our Asian allies recognize that these investments benefit many of their companies as much as they benefit uh, American companies as well. We have some high-profile disputes on things like consumer tax credits for electric vehicles. But I would tell you both in economic and emissions concerns, it is, does not matter whether you can sell a Mercedes E-Class in this neighborhood to a high-income taxpayer in the United States and get a $7,500 credit or not, we can fight about it. But it doesn't matter from an emissions standpoint. And so if we look at what really matters, I, I don't think that actually, I don't think that either the IRA is protectionist or that we're going to face a wave of deglobalization, even though I recognize that you're worried about both of those. Um. We can get into this even deeper, but uh, there's one other topic I want to discuss before we turn to the audience. I'm going to encourage my, my uh, audience to get some questions ready. Um, I'll come to you in just a few minutes. But you put another big idea on the table. I want to unpack that a little bit. That is this idea of a global Marshall Plan. It's really the topic of, uh, vital topic of financing uh, the clean energy transition globally. Um, the U.S., as you rightly said, hopes to contribute to this uh, by innovation spillovers, right, by reducing... Uh, cost to uh, what Bill Gates has called the green premium, and hopefully everybody in the world will adopt it. That's a terrific plan, but it's probably not enough. I think you'd agree. Uh, hence your idea for some kind of Marshall Plan. This has been a, a, some version of this was discussed at a summit President Macron hosted in Paris recently. It'll be a topic of the COP summit, of course, in Dubai coming up uh, in a few weeks. It's a thorny problem, right? Um, at uh, the COP summit, the climate summit run by the United Nations, um, heads are going to be budding on whether the rich world will complete a $100 billion pledge that was supposed to have been finished by 2020, which hasn't yet been completed, when, by the estimates of the International Energy Agency and others, the scale of the problem is multiple trillions of dollars a year, $4 trillion a year, perhaps, per annum, needed to go into clean energy to achieve net zero goals by the end of this decade, per annum, most of it in the developing world. So the politicians are going to be talking about something that's almost irrelevant, other than as an important symbol, nevertheless, virtue signaling. What's your big idea, other than, as you admittedly said, you're not a political operator, you're a policy guy, what's the kind of policy that you think could get, a, get us out of the gate on this one? What's a big idea? Yeah, look, the scale is, um, the scale is breathtaking when you think about it in the, in the, in the realm of the, you know, uh, of the trillions of dollars necessary. Um, but the opportunity is very much in reach. Number one, driving down those green premiums mm -hmm. And doing it in five years rather than 10 years, or two years rather than four years, is, is a game-changing in terms of the ability to deploy at scale. Um, and look to utility-scale solar as an example. Um, at, once you get down cheap, you can deploy at scale. You still have a lot of problems, but you can, you can actually see line of sight to deploying into the trillions of dollars. 
So that's number one, and we have to get those policies right. We've been spending a lot of time on that, harmonizing industrial strategies in developed market countries where they have the fiscal space and the resources to invest public dollars in doing that. That's number one. But number two, it is not self-executing, and it alone is wholly insufficient. Anyone who stands up and says, because the IRA is going to drive down the cost of deployable technology, the United States has done its part uh, in this effort, um, I think is, is, is missing, uh, missing the game. So the second, the second big thing that we need to do is we need to radically scale up the, the finance capabilities that we put on the table to actually make it financially viable to deploy in development mar developing market economies. Is this coming from Wall Street banks? Is it coming from the World Bank and IFIs under a new mandate to lend more? Would it be philanthropy? I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of ideas kicking around. Hybrid finance and yeah. novel instruments. Uh, I think our colleagues uh, at SIPA with the World Economic Forum put together a proposal for Forex risk uh, that's been kicking around to reduce Forex risk. Lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them seems to be adequate to, to change, you know, move the needle. That, at least thus far. Yep. Um, do you see any, how do we break this logjam? What's an idea big enough to really champion? So we need a very significant quantum of concessional finance or non-commercial capital that you can use and to deploy to underwrite a lot of these creative solutions. And a lot of these creative solutions are trying to get around the fundamental issue that you are going to need to be catalytic in trying to extend and deploy technologies in places where they're close to uh, in the market, but not, uh, uh, but not quite there. So I guess my point in this context on policy is that we're going to need the developed countries, including the United States, to appropriate more dollars into catalytic or you know, uh, grant or other similar, uh, similar type mechanisms to then underwrite a lot of these uh, strategies. But we have a lot of capacity to do that with the existing tools that we have today. So as much as we are going to need to galvanize additional resources, we also have to galvanize the, real, the will to actually drive really path-breaking reforms in places like the World Bank, like the other multilateral development banks, like the Development Finance Corp in the United States, to unlock the capability that we have today. And frankly, the only way we're going to get more resources is if we demonstrate that we have the will to actually do the reforms and use the tools that we have today at much greater scale. Right. And there are some initiatives like the Bridgetown Initiative and others to try to find novel approaches to unlocking that capital. So, so maybe there will be some progress. Let's hope. Um, I had promised questions uh, to the audience. Let's see a show of hands. Who's, who's uh, got a question? I see an eager lady in the back. Let's get a microphone there. Uh, rules of the road, please identify yourself and make it a short and sharp question. No long-winded speeches, please. We all hit a gas bag. Okay, the microphone is making its way to you. I appreciate it if you could make your way to the aisle, if at all possible, just in the interest of efficiency. Thanks so much. And then we'll move towards the front, because I think I saw uh, a hand Thank closer you. to the front. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Grace from Columbia Law School. I actually have a question about transmission system. Because as far as I know, um, we actually built uh, enough adequate... Um, Hold the microphone closer to your mouth, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, as far as I know, we actually built uh, adequate renewable energies. However, there our transmission systems are overwhelmed. So it's very difficult for right. for connect the, the electricity from the uh, from the wind or solar to the family and the uh, other buildings. So how do you think about that? Great, what great question. We do? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, transmission grid overloaded. Uh, NIMBY, even bananas, right? Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. That's the American motto. What do we do? So, yeah, look, look. Um, uh, building a transmission grid at the core of what I was referring to as the American building agenda, right? Um, specifically on transmission, uh, we're going to need to do a couple of things. The first is the federal government does need more authority than we have today to actually designate corridors of national significance and then exercise eminent domain or something approximating that to actually overcome the fact that you can have 35 or 40 counties in a string of a long transmission system and any one county can block progress. We need, we're going to need to have more um, capacity to actually overcome that. I think if you have that in practice, you end up with many more negotiated uh, solutions. At the same time, we have extraordinary opportunity for innovation to make our grid more efficient as we are building out, doing the hard work of actually building transmission systems at scale. And there are 
fantastic technologies uh, that are being that where there's a lot of innovation at play where we can actually make the grid more efficient but that's where we do need to retort, reform our utility markets so that investors can actually get paid for enhancements that improve the efficiency um, of our grid system and not just building more making more capital investments and building more uh, more lines there have been some suggestions um, that uh the Aspen Institute had a bipartisan study on this last year that perhaps projects uh, that are uh, quite important for climate change could receive some kind of designation, projects of national interest. That is a designation the European Commission has for certain projects. Germany uses this, where unless there's clear reason to stop it, it should be assumed to be on a fast track or a green light. Uh, that is flipped the usual calculation of assumed to go on a 10 year track of lawsuits and obstacles. Uh, and uh, it, it, what do you think about that kind of green lighting of a certain category of climate related projects? Could that work or is that uh, just wishful thinking? No, I think, look, I think it's in, the, it's, in, it's, it's in the zone of what we're going to need. That we do need as a country to designate these quarters of national significance. Um, and we know where they are um, in large part. And we do need to give the federal government more authority than it has today to actually say, this is where it's going to be and the presumption is that. Now, you know, we do operate in a system of laws and a system of checks and balances, and, and so there are appropriate limits to how, you know, uniformly you can do that. Uh, but I also will say we could make some changes that would, would really change the negotiating dynamic because if, if the federal government has the power to do that, but for an extraordinary circumstance, you can find ways to harmonize that. And look, if we have that will and authority, we can also get much more creative. We have a lot of corridors today. Uh, where we've already built stuff, highways, uh, railroad tracks, otherwise. Um, in fact, n stitching together the transmission systems we need, if I could put a map up here and show you exactly where the 22 transmission lines are, in a number of places, you can connect a highway and a rail line and otherwise, where you've got 95% of the corridor down. And the authority you need is not to sort of run roughshod over big parts of the United States, but one or two communities or, or, or elements where you're holding up a project of national significance, right? And you need to be careful about doing that, and you don't want to run uh, a ragged over people's rights. But clearly, we need to change the balance of power here so that we can build more efficiently. Great. Thank you. Uh, do I see another hand there? Uh, where's my microphone, if I may? Oh, it's on this side. Okay, let's come to this side. Uh, let's see if maybe the... Uh, I see someone in white there. Yep, the white shirt. Thank you. Again, please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Emily Ford. I'm an alumni of the business school. Um, and I am interested in the energy transition. And what do we do with the aging infrastructure? Are we just going to be able to switch? Uh, do we need a crutch? What does that timeline look like? Um, what does that mean for innovation? How, yeah, how do we get through this transition? I think we all agree that the urgency, the scale, and the uh, the inflection point is you know is is now. But uh, how do we make the switch? Thank you. Yeah, what do we do with all this dirty capital equipment that we have lying around? Well, um, big parts of that actually represent opportunity to drive the transition more effectively and efficiently give you a concrete example. The best possible place right now to build new solar or new onshore wind is co-located with an existing coal-fired power plant where you already have an interconnection into the grid that we were just talking about. So if connecting into the grid is a big problem, the places where that is the easiest today are the places where you have incumbent baseload fossil uh, uh, production that is already plugged into the grid, which is why we're seeing some of the largest projects actually happening in places where you have a decommissioned uh, coal plant. In other places, the, the decommissioned coal plant itself is being repurposed, for example, in, uh, in Wyoming to build small modular nuclear reactors in the same plant uh, where many of the same workers are actually um, on the job now because the, the, the skills required are actually quite transferable. So there are, there are opportunities in some cases to actually harness the existing capabilities, assets we have as a country uh, in the United States and try to deploy them. Uh, in other cases, uh, the, this, uh, this transition is going to be about 
you know, taking the capabilities uh, that, that people have and that, that, and that companies have uh, and deploying them against new problems. So, you know, a lot of the questions around how we're going to build, for example, clean hydrogen are questions about the production and movement of molecules that actually are, you know, quite suited to the skill sets of a number of the existing oil and gas companies. Similar with uh, geothermal, which is about, you know, drilling holes into the ground, um, but instead of trying to capture natural gas or oil, to try to capture heat associated with... Um, the skill sets are very similar. Now, there's a question about whether that means that many of the companies who are existing, you know, um, operating in the existing uh, uh, traditional fossil fuel space, whether they themselves are going to make that transition, or whether the people who work at those companies have a lot of skills and might be, you know, induced to go work for a new company who has a newer idea um, uh, and more capacity. I'm probably more of a buyer of the latter than the former as a, as a, as a, as a theory of change just in terms of what I'm seeing in the economy right now. Uh, but I think that's another, you know, we don't have to prejudge that for, at the outset, um, and we can let, um, you know, we can let the market sort some of those questions out. Yeah, just to underline your comments, that there is a, a momentum growing on what's called the brown to green investment thesis, which really gets to your question, what do we do with a lot of the dirty capital stock, and rather than only investing in the new, the green, um, transforming it, and this is something, in fact, I think uh, BlackRock, uh, world's largest asset manager company, perhaps known to our speaker today, um, uh, has even a specific brown to green materials fund, for example, and others as well are in this space. So I think there's a real opportunity that people will get into to help this transition move along uh, in, in some of the ways that uh, we've just heard. Let's go to this side. I think there's a microphone and uh, someone with a question. Again, please identify yourself. Yeah, I'm a, I'm Suzy, reporter from Korea Economic Daily, and I have a two questions. The so first let's keep is, it to one question, please. We're almost okay. out of time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just have a question then. Uh, many foreign companies, including Korea, uh, are making substantial uh, substantial investment based on I IRA. And uh, is there any possibility that despite they meeting the investment requirements, they might not receive subsidies due to the fiscal challenges in uh, faced by the U U.S. government? I, th I, th I think I understood the question to believe, I just want to confirm that is there, is there a risk that because of the uh, political environment in the U.S. that the, the subsidies in the IRA may not be available to companies down the road? From yeah. other countries, foreign com companies. Yeah. So, um, so look, I, th I, think that, I think at the core of that question is, is the risk that uh, a future Congress might um, seek to undo part or all of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and uh, that's obviously that's a fair question, and, and uh, ultimately, um, I can't predict uh, I can't predict the, f the the future on that. There's there's a chance, uh, of course, any future Congress can uh, can change uh, existing law. I think it's um, unlikely, uh, and I think it it's it's unlikely for uh, for two reasons. One is big parts of the agenda here actually were either passed explicitly with bipartisan support, like the. Uh, the infrastructure bill that is actually doing most of the investments, for example, in electric vehicle charging or in hydrogen, um, or has a lot of bipartisan support on the ground in the places where these investments are actually happening. Uh, you can say it more strongly. Most of the money is going to red states. Well, not, not only is most the of the money, not as only, I mean, most of the money going to red states is true, but, but that could also be reflect uh, states saying, great, we'll take the money, but then, you know, uh, but, uh, but we're not going to uh, support the policy in the future. I, I think that, like, that at core, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is new in American economic policy also in that it is intensely local and place-based. These are investments that are happening in particular communities, and in those communities, it changes the complexion of the economic opportunity. Uh, and the more that that happens, the more that I think this is going to get built into the fabric of our economy. So, um, you know, I can't predict the future, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, I see a hand there. Let's uh, have one final quick question. Yes, up on top. Uh, very quickly, because we just have five minutes, please. All right, thanks. Um, Mike Schuster, second year MBA student. Uh, my question, Brian, well, first off, thank you for everything that you've done and for being here. Um, my question is really to get a sense of how concerned are you with U.S. bank regulators' Basel III endgame proposal right now? Um, for those of you that don't know, ACOR has said that it could completely wipe out the tax equity market 80 to 90%. IRA obviously is very heavily uh, based on tax credits, so are you worried that it could get passed as is? 
what do you think the National Economic Council's role is in uh, massaging it until the final decision uh, in mid-2024? I warned you, this is the bastion of financial capitalism. You gotta no, get into the weeds uh, here. I, <laughs> The thing I love about the last part of your question is that n now that I no longer am the head of the National Economic Council, I can say that that is definitively somebody else's problem. Um, <laughs> uh, and the good news is that the current occupant of the National Economic Council uh, is an expert on many things, uh, one of which is uh, finalizing Federal Reserve banking regulations uh, because it was her prior job. Um, so uh, all joking aside, they they will they will f figure that out in the way in in the way that is appropriate. I think that your question. Uh, let me let me let me let me take your question and try to broaden it a little bit. Which is, you know, there are concerns about the ways in which we implement um, adjacent regulation on banks or or in tax policy or otherwise that could actually intentionally or unintentionally reduce the economic impact of the IRA incentives that we have in place. Another one of these places that comes into impact is we have a. Um, a new corporate minimum tax in the United States, a 15% corporate minimum tax, but if implemented in the way that other countries are doing, it would actually um, sweep in clean energy tax credits, and would, which reduce the marginal incentive for that. So yes, I think we have to be very cognizant of the unintentional uh, impacts of regulation. The one thing I will say on this front, one of the sleeper hits of the IRA, and I won't go too long, because I could go on for a long time about sleeper hits in the IRA. One of the sleeper like hits a in the IRA. Karaoke session afterward. Yeah, party upstairs. <laughs> we'll go. We'll go like super wonky after this. This this moderate wonky um, is that it's fundamentally disrupting the tax equity market. So um, so prior to the IRA, the only way that you could really harvest the benefits of um, some of these production and investment tax credits is the tax equity market. You have to take an equity position in the project. It's very complicated. Very few counterparties do it. It's mainly just the large banks. That's why Basel comes into play. The IRA opened up something from called transferability, which means that you can actually transfer the tax credits from any entity that has uh, a tax liability, uh, which should create a liquid market in, uh, in transferring tax credits and really mean that a much broader set of uh, counterparties in our economy can actually transact. And we're already starting to see that where a typical tax equity transaction traded with a 30% discount, which means we were basically paying 30 cents on every dollar of public subsidy just to, for the, the privilege of having an intermediary uh, transact that. We're already seeing those premiums start to come down, and hopefully transferable credit transactions will start to get down into you know, the single digits and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe lower than that. That's good economically, but it also means that we are broadening the base of potential counterparties beyond just the uh, the financial institutions that would be affected by Basel, uh, which is not to say it's not an issue. We do need to be cognizant of those, uh, but I actually think that the transferability issue will be a much bigger impact on the market than anything that Basel does at the margin. I think you'll all agree that um, our speaker's breadth and depth of knowledge is something that we have benefited from tonight and the country has benefited from from your time at the White House. So let's give him a round of applause for joining us today. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Bruce to close this out.